Friends, we have the privilege in this series of becoming acquainted with one of the most important creeds in the history of the Christian church. But before we begin our studies, let us seek the divine blessing. Heavenly Father, who we believe are behind this creed through the movements of thy spirit, we pray that thou wilt bestow upon us that same spirit that we may study this study of thy word and by it learn more of thy infallible truth in Holy Scripture. For Jesus' sake we ask it. Amen. We're studying in this little series the Westminster Confession of Faith. This is one of the most important creeds of Protestantism and especially the Reformed tradition. And as far as the Reformed tradition is concerned, especially that part of it called the Presbyterian Church has honored this creed and used it more extensively than any other creed or probably all of our creeds combined. It is interesting to notice that this is je was prepared just about an even century after the death of Martin Luther. So it represents a continuation of the Reformation doctrine of Luther and Zwingli and Calvin and Cranmer and Knox, and at the same time has the advantage of a century of important controversies and further sharpening of the position of the Reformation and gives us, in a sense, in a very scientific way of stating in balanced fashion, the crystallization of the Reformation as the Reformed churches have seen it down through the ages and still do. To this day, this particular creed is widely used and, as I say, among Presbyterianism, more widely used than any other creed. It was written at the British uh, uh, Empire for the purposes of uniting uh, England, Scotland, and Ireland in a single creed and bringing unity following the tumults of the Stuart kingship in Britain and the Cromwellian Revolution. It didn't actually succeed in that purpose because because of various and sundry political developments, but it did succeed in being the definitive statement of Reformed theology in the British Isles and largely in America as well from that time until this. Now, the form of the Westminster Confession from which I will be reading uh, is the shape it took by 1958. It was finished in 1647, and in the intervening centuries, there were a few minor criticisms made and one or two major ones, and they had to do with the civil magistrate with marriage and divorce. In 1903, uh, the 34th and 35th chapters in a declaratory statement were added dealing with the Holy Spirit and the love of God and missions and added uh, not a new a item to the existing 33 chapters, but more of a new viewpoint. The church was concerned in America in 1903 to see that there wasn't a misunderstanding of certain aspects of it, and so that elaboration took place. It'll be our purpose, therefore, to deal with these uh, 33 chapters uh, essentially as they were originally de delivered at the Westminster Assembly with the two supplementary ones and a couple minor changes that we'll note as we go along. The most important thing I would say to know about the Westminster uh, uh, Confession, theologically speaking, is that it is a determined attempt to remain faithful to the Bible and to explain in brief compass what the 66 books of Holy Scripture actually do reveal. It is a magnificent coverage of the subject in a very systematic fashion, beginning with the doctrine of Scripture itself and ending in the original 33 chapters with the final judgment and the last things. It's very comprehensive and at the same time very detailed as far as such brief coverage will uh, permit. 
Now, it's our purpose in this uh, hasty survey of it uh, to read it to you very rapidly and make a few brief comments so that you'll get the fundamental focal point of these divines as they develop various doctrines of Holy Scripture in the systematic form in which they believed they were meant to be understood and presented and preached to a perishing world. This point that I've just made that these divines recognize the Bible as the only infallible rule of faith and practice and their uh, systematization of it as dependent entirely on the accuracy of their rendering of the teaching of Holy Scripture, that point is evident in the very first chapter. Many people, including the lecturer you are now listening to, believe that this is the finest chapter in the entire uh, Westminster Confession of Faith, which has some sterling sections indeed. For example, we'll come to the chapter on good works, and I don't know how that can be improved. But surely this first chapter is tremendous and foundational and the divines themselves would consider the whole Westminster Confession of Faith good, bad, or indifferent only insofar as it was a good, bad, or indifferent exposition of the Word of God. Sometimes, you know, people uh, present the Bible is over against the creed or the creed is over against the Bible. Certainly this creed was not intended to be against the Bible, but absolutely subservient to the Bible and serving the purpose only of making clear in brief compass what the whole message of the Bible actually is. Now, we won't have time in a brief series like this to give the various biblical texts on which these statements rest, but the divines gave them. And in some of the forms of printing of this, you can get the Westminster Confession of Faith, sometimes with the mere citations, sometimes with the text actually written out in the King James Version from which they were, uh, were taken. I will not have time here, but I want to remind you at the outset, and I probably will say so from time to time, that these statements were not just unfolded as a kind of theological implication by a group of master systematic theologians. These were based on solid study of the Hebrew Old Testament, Greek New Testament, and the putting together of them after the ascertaining of the various texts had been achieved. Now please remember, all of these statements, though they may never even quote the Bible, rest squarely upon the Bible and are to be tested by the Bible, by you. As I say, I don't have time here to do it. Now we take, therefore, to begin with, this most important of all of the 33 original chapters entitled, Of the Holy Scripture. It has none th nothing less than 10 sections. I'll read them very rapidly and make brief comment. The first very basic section in this very basic chapter reads this way. Although the light of nature and the works of creation and providence do so far manifest the goodness, wisdom, and power of God as to leave men inexcusable, yet they are not sufficient to give that salvation of God and of His will, which is necessary unto salvation. Therefore it pleased the Lord at sundry times and in divers manners to reveal Himself and to declare that his will unto his church, and afterwards for the better preserving and propagating of the truth, and for the more sure establishment and comfort of the church against the corruption of the flesh and the malice of Satan and of the world, to commit the same wholly unto writing, which maketh the holy scriptures to be most necessary, those former ways of God's revealing His will unto His people being now ceased. You see what, the, what Westminster is saying is that God has revealed Himself clearly in the things that He has made. Romans chapter 1 was basal in their thinking, but no one is ever saved by the knowledge of God which he gets through the creation. This is Gerstner adding it at this point, but the divines would have agreed that the revelation of God from nature, though it's clear and it comes across and all men know God, nevertheless is the power of God to damnation rather than salvation. No one is ever saved by the knowledge of God 
which he gave and gives through nature. Rather, as the Westminster divine stressed, they are left inexcusable for not worshiping a God whom they know so well. And on the basis of that observation, they go on to point out the crucial matter that another revelation was necessary for salvation. And that revelation is in Holy Scripture, which God gave in writing so that it couldn't be corrupted and so that it would tell us clearly in his own language, given through men whom he inspired, what the will of God for our salvation and the way of salvation actually is. Now chapter 2, section 2 of chapter 1, uh, is a canonical question. It deals with what are the books of Scripture. Under the name of Holy Scripture, or the Word of God written, are now contained all the books of the Old and New Testament, which are these. And it enumerates from Genesis to Revelation. I need not take time to do that. Section 2 is concluded with this simple sentence, all which, that is these 66 books which are enumerated, are given by inspiration of God to be the rule of faith and life. Now you see twice in that one section it refers to these being the Word of God written and inspired. So that though uh, Westminster doesn't say in so many words that the Bible is the inspired Word of God and it is inerrant in all that it contains, but certainly the synonyms for that concept are there. And there's no doubt that these divines who prepared this statement, all of them, I don't know of a solitary exception, among the men who participated in the formation of this creed, all of them believed that the Bible was inspired by God in all of its parts and was an infallible rule and is an infallible rule for our faith and our practice alike. Now the third section deals with a negative point concerning the Apocrypha. The books commonly called Apocrypha are <coughs> not being of divine inspiration, are no part of the canon, uh, the list, see that means, of the scripture, and therefore are of no authority in the church of God, nor to be otherwise approved or made use of than other human writings. See, the Apocrypha refers to that literature which was written in the 400 years that lapsed between the ending of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament. Tobit's a well-known uh, book, and there are a dozen others as well, and they tell interesting doctrines and interesting stories, some of which are salutary, some of which are very heretical. But our, our fathers here simply say these are human writings, and by implication they have the fallibility as well as the correctness of human writings and must be used with discretion but are not a part of the Bible. They're not deuterocanonical, they're not a second level canonical, they are not in any sense canonical. The 66 books are exhausted when you've run from generation, Genesis to, uh, uh, to Revelation, is what it is uh, saying here. Now the fourth section of chapter 1 of Holy Scripture is very, very important. The authority of the Holy Scripture for which it ought to be believed and obeyed dependeth not upon the testimony of any man or church, but wholly upon God, who is truth itself, the author thereof. And therefore it is to be received because it is the Word of God. See, there's no question whatever uh, that uh, the Westminster divines had Rome in mind especially. B.B. Warfield has once said about the canon of Scripture, according to Protestantism, Westminster Confession of Faith and all other creeds of Protestantism, according to the, the canon is a collection of inspired books. According to Romanism, the canon is an inspired collection of books. One priest once said, for example, if his church had taught him that Aesop's fables was inspired and Matthew was not inspired, he would believe that Aesop's fables was inspired and Matthew was not inspired. In other words, he would be controlled not because of any inherent authority in the books, but because his particular church said that such and such was the inspiration of the Bible or of whatever the writing may be. Now Westminster is saying, no, the authority is in 
the word itself and only in the word, not in the verdict of a reformed church or any other church, but only in the verdict of scripture itself. And a person is to receive it because it's the word of God, believe it because it's the word of God and follow it and practice it because and only because it is the word of God. Never for a moment doing, believing anything it teaches or practicing anything it commands for any other reason than that it is God who teaches and commands. Number five, we may be moved and induced by the testimony of the church to an high and reverent esteem of Holy Scripture and the heavenliness of the matter, the efficacy of the doctrine, the majesty of the style, the consent of all the parts, the scope of the whole, which is to give all glory to God, the full discovery it makes of the only way of man's salvation, the, ma the many other incomparable excellencies and the entire perfection thereof are arguments whereby it doth abundantly evidence itself to be the Word of God. Yet, notwithstanding our full persuasion and assurance of the infallible truth and the divine authority thereof is from the inward work of the Holy Spirit bearing witness by and with the Word in our hearts. There are many persons who believe that chapter 1 is the greatest chapter in what may be the greatest creed of all time, and section 5, which I have just read, is the greatest part of the greatest chapter of what may be the greatest creed of all time. You see what it's saying here, the testimony of the church and the unity of the evidence and the power that God works through it and so on is evidence that the Bible is the Word of God. It's absolutely irrefutable evidence. It's solid evidence. It's compelling evidence. But, they hasten to say, what brings the persuasion is not the evidence, but the working of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. You see, there's a difference here between proof and persuasion. They're two different things. And the Westminster Divines are saying there is external, demonstrative, compelling proof that the 66 books of the canon are nothing less than the inspired and infallible Word of God. But in spite of the fact that the evidence is overwhelming and it does abundantly evidence the Bible to be the Word of God, Westminster is saying no one is persuaded by it unless the Spirit works along with it. See, I'm a teacher, for example. Right now, the Westminster Confession of Faith. I could use the evidence it had, and I'm alluding to it, but I can't have any time to develop it, to show that there is biblical evidence that it's the Word of God. But if I'm true to Westminster, I would know that even though I could speak with the tongue of men and of angels and beat down every argument raised against it and established impregnably every proof of it, no one of you would ever be persuaded of it unless a being other than myself and quite out of my control actually along with the evidence that I am responsible for presenting brings the persuasion of it. Now, if you ask yourself the question, why? I get what you're saying, and I understand what Westminster is maintaining, but why is it if the proof is so compelling that people don't accept it on the basis of the evidence? Why is it if it does so abundantly evidence itself to be the Word of God that persuasion doesn't follow? Well, Westminster doesn't answer this here. You're going to have to wait until chapter 6 and 7 before you see the answer to that and when it talks about the fall of man and the sinfulness of man. But I may anticipate briefly, the reason the proof does not persuade is not because it isn't compelling, but because we are sinners. Not because we don't see the light, but because we don't like the light. It's quite analogous, and Westminster would be right with me on this, though I'm drawing on my own understanding at this particular point, you understand. Quite analogous to the statement of Christ, this is the condemnation. Light is coming to the world, and men loved the darkness. 
He was referring to himself as the light of the world. And of course, this book we're studying, the Bible, is indeed what bears witness to him. So it's the light to the world, inscripturated just as he is the light to the world incarnate. When he is saying the reason people don't believe in him is not because his evidence of being the divine son of God is not utterly overwhelming and compelling, but because they don't like what he is. They don't like the light. They love the darkness. And so analogously here, the reason this is insufficient is not because of it, but because of us. And what is necessary for us to have persuasion is a work of another being because, as we'll see in chapter 9, for example, it's the Holy Spirit who changes our hearts. I may say uh, that this, this may well be the most important section of, of the most important chapter, but it is also the most misunderstood section without question. This particular section 5 of chapter 1 is the most misunderstood for the simple reason that most people think that this is denying evidence and de uh, depending entirely on an internal conviction, and that is not true. The evidence abundantly evidences or proves the Bible to be the Word of God. Westminster, the same as John Calvin, developed the classical arguments which are still with us for the proof of Scripture, but what it's recognizing is that proof isn't all that's necessary. When a person is hostile to proof, he has to be changed. And that's the problem with a person. It isn't piling up more evidence, because the more evidence you get, the more hostile he becomes, because he doesn't like what you're proving. He has to be changed. But you see, the fact that it recognizes that does not mean that it implies pejoratively a diminution or rejection of this point. Now section number six. The whole counsel of God concerning all things necessary for his own glory, man's salvation, faith, and life is an either expressly set down in Scripture or by good and necessary consequence may be deduced from Scripture, unto which nothing at any time is to be added, whether by new revelations of the Spirit or traditions of men. Nevertheless, we acknowledge the inward illumination of the Spirit of God to be necessary for the saving understanding of such things as are revealed in the Word. And there are some circumstances concerning the worship of God and the government of the church common to human actions and society, which are to be ordered by the light of nature and Christian prudence according to the general rules of the Word of God, which are always to be observed. Many things in that section, but the one thing I'll take time to uh, call your special attention is this matter of deduction. See, Scripture either teaches something explicitly, in so many words, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, or implicitly. And wherever anything is inferred by Scripture, or can be deduced from Scripture correctly, that which is deduced is as much the teaching of the Word of God which is written as, is, as what is written in so many words. That's what's being said. I'll give you an illustration of that. One time I was talking with my friend Marcus Bart, who's had trouble with this idea of deducing, a little uncomfortable with it. And as I was walking across the breezeway to our, uh, we were walking together to our respective classes and so on, I said, Marcus, look, doesn't the Bible say that Marcus Bart should not kill? Of course it doesn't use your name. It just says to man in general, thou shalt not kill. And you're a man, and I'm a man, and consequently it says by deduction, because your name is not in that book and neither is mine, but it wouldn't be a bit clearer if the Bible said, Thou, Marcus Bart, thou, Jack Gerstner, shall not kill. But it's a just and necessary consequence. But you know full well you wouldn't be under any heavier mandate to avoid murder if your name was in that book expressly. Thou, Marcus Bart, as it is implicitly, a deduction. So why be opposed to it? Most of our understanding of the Bible is deduction and virtually a half of our preaching. After we've expounded the text, we apply it, which means we say, this is what follows from it. And a person is a good preacher. And these people, for example, who drew up this, they recognized the most important part of preaching was not the exposition, essential as that was, 
But the peculiar role of preaching was to take that very careful exposition of the Word of God and apply it carefully to the lives of the people in the church. Number seven, all things in Scripture are not alike plain in themselves. That's a relief to a great many of you, I'm sure. Nor alike clear unto all. I'm one of them. Yet those things which are necessary to be known, believed and observed for salvation are so clearly understood, propounded and opened in the same, some place of Scripture or other, that not only the learned, but the unlearned in a due use of ordinary means may attain unto a sufficient understanding of them. This ought to be a, it may well be the favorite section of the favorite chapter for you out there. No, you don't have to know as much as I do. I'm a professional, I'm specially trained, I'm a teacher, and so on. And no, you may not be able to understand as much as a professionally trained person. But what this passage is saying, you can understand very clearly you, I don't care what your IQ is, I don't care how much education you've not had, you can understand clearly, Westminster is saying, what is necessary for your salvation. And if anybody is lost out there, it will not be because he couldn't understand what the Word of God was saying. Number eight, the Old Testament in Hebrew and the New Testament in Greek being immediately inspired by God and by His singular care and providence kept pure in all ages, are therefore authentical. So as in all controversies of religion, the church is finally to appeal unto them. But because these original tongues are not known to all the people of God who have right unto and interest in the Scriptures and are commanded in the fear of God to read and search them, therefore they are to be translated into the language of every people into which they come, that the Word of God, dwelling plentifully in all, they may worship Him in an acceptable manner and through patience and comfort of the Scripture may have hope. In other words, it's perfectly true, there are professionals who deal with the original language and some controversies will have to be settled by them and those of you who don't know those languages will have to listen carefully and make your own critical judgment depending on the knowledge of people who are specialists where you are not uh, specialists. That's recognized. In other words, everything that's necessary to salvation is clear to every one of you. Some of these things may get away from you and you may have to depend upon the expertise of certain areas, but they will never be areas of cruciality to your salvation. Now, anything the Word of God says is important, and consequently any controversy is important. And this is what Westminster is saying. It's in one section that you can understand all that's essential. Some of these points which the church has controverted will have to be handled by people who deal with the Hebrew and the Greek and other technicalities and so on. Number nine, the infallible rule of interpretation of Scripture is the Scripture itself one of the greatest principles of all. And therefore, when there is a question about the true and full sense of any Scripture, which is not manifold but one, Scripture doesn't contradict itself, it only teaches one thing, it may be searched and known by other places that speak more clearly. You see, for example, if I were a specialist in Hebrew and Greek and so on, and knew all there was about a number of texts in Hebrew and in Greek and so on, you still would have this advantage over me. If you knew the Bible as a whole, in a good, solid translation in your language, better than I did, you really would understand the Word of God better than I, though I might have some technical expertise in a Hebrew text and a Greek text here and there and so on. You get the point there that Scripture is to be interpreted by Scripture. And there's just no substitute for a basic understanding of the Word of God as a whole. And then it finally concludes with this majestic statement. I don't have much time and I don't need much time. Just listen to it. The, judgment, the supreme judge by whom all controversies of religion are to be determined and the decrees of councils, opinion of ancient writers, doctrines of men and private spirits are to be examined and in whose sentence we are to rest can be no other but the Holy Spirit speaking in Scripture. The Holy Spirit speaking. Present tense. You see, the Scripture's finished. The 66 chapters have been completed two millennia ago. Nothing is to be added, and the Spirit of God has in a certain sense not opened His mouth since. We don't have one line of divine inspiration since the canon closed. But what was said is still as true as when it was said, and it is as binding on us today as if the Spirit of God were speaking to us person to person and eyeball to eyeball. 
That's what this is saying. The Spirit of God is not speaking new truth. He is just saying constantly until the end of the age what he has divinely inspired in the Holy Scripture. Thus endeth the first chapter of the Westminster Confession of Faith. Bless us, our Father, as we continue to meditate upon these truths about thy word that the divines have called to our attention, but especially give us the grace to do it in our actual meditation on thy word itself. For Jesus' sake we pray, amen.